hosting live broadcast. We are broadcasting live with accountants, bookkeepers, and business owners. Show us those guns, especially you, Doug Sleater, after coming <laughs> off of this incredibly successful Sleater Solutions 13 accounting conference. I really want to see those guns. So, uh, Doug, let's start with you. Tell us about it. Now that it's done, are you relieved? Uh, well, relieved. Um so I guess that's part of the word, uh, part one of the words for it. So yeah, it was great. It was just, uh, I don't know. It had this feeling of uh, I got all these notes, these handwritten notes, and and, uh, and email notes from people just saying how much they really enjoyed the. Again, it's the family feel, the uh, the networking between people that they know online, like we're doing here, but they never get to see each other. We saw Sarah. Uh, and her husband was there, um, and let's see who else was there. Uh, just Sarah, you, Seth, and nobody else here. Um, we missed you, Dennis. You should come. <laughs> I was uh, talking to Shelly Robbins, and she was at the uh, Freedom of the Cloud, and she was wearing bunny slippers because she, I guess, danced so much at the Sweeter Conference she couldn't walk in shoes. <laughs> so she conducted the meeting in her bunny slippers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, and the conference started off with, um, well, the, the pre-conference a great uh, session on social media, and uh, there was really nine different pre-conference sessions where you could get certified in QBO, you could get certified in Xero. Uh, you know, those all were very well attended. There were, uh, it was small compared to the big conference, but uh, there were some really good ones there. How was your session from your perspective, Seth? It was amazing. I, um, you know, I don't even know where to begin. I'm, I was overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed throughout the whole conference, actually, with the number of people who were coming up to me. And first of all, after I had started doing the sessions, the people telling me how much they enjoyed my sessions. I mean, of course, it's going to feel good to get that kind of feedback from people. Mm -hmm. And I got uh, that kind of feedback, you know, at an overwhelming level. And it was really fun. You know, I, I knew that the three hours were going to go by very quickly, and they did. Um, and it worked out perfectly. Uh, there were some things I wanted to cover that I didn't get to, but it turned out okay because I think what I did cover was really good. <laughs> and I'll tell you something, you're right about the family feel. I, in fact, a few people commented to me, you know, like almost as an aside, like that they got the feeling that this year more than any other year, uh, they felt like people were much more uh, open and approachable and friendly than ever before. You know, the, that everybody, was, it was really a family kind of feel, and, uh, yeah. you know, I definitely got that vibe from people. But yeah. uh, it was funny. Two uh, women had left the session in the middle, and I, you know, I know better than to take that personally. I don't think anything of it, really. You know, there could be any number of reasons. It could be that they didn't like my session, and that's okay. I don't expect everybody to like me. But... Um, it could also be that they wanted to check out some of the other sessions. So later on that day, I'm walking down the hallway into the exhibit uh, hall, and they were sitting on the side, and they called me over, and you know, they like, sort of granting, like, "Hey, hey, we, we need to talk to you," kind of thing. And I was thinking, "Uh oh, I'm going to get reamed now," because I recognize them, the ones who left. And they said, "We just wanted to let you know that we thought you were wonderful, but the subject matter was just way over our head, you know, because I was teaching how to edit video in that." Oh, actually, uh, yeah, we heard that. We heard, and that's funny because of all the different feedback, I did hear that. And you know what that led in led me to kind of conclude uh, about the whole conference, what, what we're going to do, you know, because obviously the biggest, most important from my perspective is to learn, you know, what they like, but also what they don't like or they need. Mm -hmm. And uh, so partly from that comment and a few others, we're going to, uh, do everything we can next year to go to three levels. So introductory materials, intermediate materials, and advanced materials on all the different topics. Uh, yeah. Because I guess we found ourselves being pretty advanced across the board. What did you think, uh, Sarah? It was all different levels. You're right. You're oh, right. it was? Well, I thought we weren't. <laughs> well, if you... If you it depends on who, who your audience is. I mean, you could look around the room and tell people, you know, there's some, you know, say an entry-level bookkeeper versus an accountant and things like that, and everybody's there for different reasons. So oh, know, we, right. selected, we selected our sessions beforehand, and then it goes 100 miles an hour. And yeah. so, 
you pretty much have to stick with what you decided the first time and then you know there was there was only one session really where I got in of course I want to be front and center so I can see and hear <laughs> and then about 20 minutes in I went oh I wish I was in the other <laughs> yeah, yeah then it's hard but, to get out you know so, so much. Um, you know like I, I, I wanted to see more on method and there just there wasn't enough time but yeah um, so what you're saying is that the people are all levels yes right Okay, and that's what I'm saying is that our content might not have been enough at all levels. So next time we're going to do varied level of content. So Seth might not do video editing, in 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 the well might only not only do one. Basically, split it up into some intro class, intermediate and, and advanced. Yeah. So. Well, and, you know the thing that occurred to me, Doug, was, and I you know I understand you really we really couldn't do anything about this, but. I had, you know, if I was able to do the social media boot camp, the shorter one, which is which is at the simpler level first, then it would have made more sense because then I could say to people, hey, we're doing this, you know, but the thing is, the free conference was the longer section and that's yeah. the one we needed to do the video editing stuff. Yeah. And because yeah. the idea really was almost as a follow-up from last year's social media boot camp, which, you know, the first year it was the short section, I did the overview. So I, when we discussed it, the idea behind this one was to say, okay, well, let's go deeper now. We've shown you the overview, the basic strategy. Now let's show you how to really dig in and create the content. And yeah. you know, so it made sense to do that in a three hour session. So of course I told the women, I, I thanked them of course for making a point of letting me know that it wasn't anything against me per se. And then I you know, told them that uh, if they attended the social media boot camp, the shorter one, that that would be you know, more along the lines probably of what they were looking for. And they did attend that session and they didn't leave. So I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we had some other surprises. Uh, Monday morning, uh, they opened up with uh, a tribute for Cheryl and me, which was just like, oh my God, tearjerker. Uh, that's wonderful. <laughs> and that was yep. totally surprised to us. Our staff did it, and um, it was a review of all the ten years of the of the conference. It's our twentieth year in business, but it was tenth year of that conference, and they did this thing on stage that showed a video and all that stuff. And it just like, ugh, it just, I, we, we couldn't believe it. So, And that's how the morning, the first day of the main conference started. But there's a story behind it that you'll enjoy. Um, so on this big stage, there are confidence monitors so that the presenters up there can, you know, kind of see their notes and see what the people see on behind them. So you're up there, and we're, we're rehearsing Sunday night and, and uh, just to kind of check the stage out and all. And anyway, so if you guys use PowerPoint in presentation mode, you know that there are uh, the, there's the slide view and what they call presenter view, which allows you to see the slide there and then your notes. So what you want to say is here, but only you see that, and the, uh, the big slides are what they see behind you. I love so, that, by the way. It's what? It's, an amazing, it's a great feature for the presenter. I love that. It That's is. Amazing. Yes, but in order for that to work in a big room like that where there's double screens back behind you and then confidence monitor here, um, the AV people have to know way in advance because they have to run another uh, video line up to this confidence so that it can be your, your, your notes view. Anyway, they didn't do that. So here we are Sunday night, and so, oh, no. Anyway, they, um, all this hurrying around Sunday night, and uh, then uh, we get into overtime, so they had to go home. So, okay, we'll come back at 7 o'clock Monday morning, and then you guys will do this. So they're, they're figuring that, anyway, so then they couldn't get that done, and instead what we did is we created basically... Uh, a whole separate presentation, which is really a hack to this whole thing, uh, so that there's your pr presentation in PowerPoint and then a whole other computer feeding another monitor with, uh, what they did is they copy-pasted all of our notes to new slides, put them on slides that projected on this other monitor, and the clicker we had on stage was supposed to advance them both. <laughs> So a clicker that just basically sends a signal to both computers, so they're both in. All right, so we're practicing this at 7.15, 7.20, 7.25. The clicker wasn't working. Uh -oh. So I would be up there, and I would say, 
Um, well, that one moved, but that one didn't. And so your blood pressure is going up. <laughs> so, and then, you know, I wasn't the only presenter. Jennifer Warawa really needed the same thing to work. So she was rehearsing all the way up till about quarter to eight. So now I get up there and I'm doing the same thing. Oh, man, it's just not working. And it was literally five minutes to eight. Actually, we couldn't even open the doors until late because of this. And it wasn't working. And so we just said, hey, we've just got to go. So we shut everything off and opened the doors and everybody had come in. And I'm backstage, and I have never sweat so much in my life. <laughs> so I'm saying there's no way this presentation is going to go well if when I click, they don't see, and I'm not, so I don't know what they're on, and I, I'm going to just get completely, completely screwed up here. And as the opening keynote of your own conference, this is like big stress. <laughs> So, I know I'm backstage just trying to do my, you know, my meditations and stuff like that, and, and then Misty goes up and introduces me, and Misty's uh, been with the company a couple, a couple months is all, but she's just fantastic. She's a great stage person. She's an actress and all that stuff. So anyway, that that starts off the conference where she goes up and she does the, you know, the housekeeping stuff and says, and Doug and Cheryl don't know this, but we're going to invite them onto the stage to do this tribute. Well, that was not the plan. I was supposed to be backstage. She was going to interview, introduce me, and then I was going to go up, and that was, you know, the first. So that was fine, though, because, all right, all right, Cheryl and I go up. Of course, we're, we're feeling really good about it. And all of a sudden, all the stress, all the absolute freak out that I was experiencing backstage just kind of went away because here I am now on stage with love everywhere. <laughs> And uh, there were 10 of our members that came up onto the stage. Uh, and uh, Pat Carson, one of the most senior members, meaning the one that's been with us the longest, she did this little s speech from the network to Doug and all that stuff. And all of a sudden, all of this tightness just went away. And I just, I'm smiling and crying. And, and then, uh, you know, they send me backstage again and then introduce me. And all of a sudden, I came up and it was almost like a whole new me. I was not going to do a good job, but for that tribute and the new kind of energy I had, I just it just went great. So uh, I don't know. I just I was really really happy about how that all worked out. Thank goodness. See, all you need is love. What? We would have never known you had a problem. Really? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it, it came off great. It really was amazing. I mean, yeah. the sessions that I saw were all. Really, really good. Just it seemed like everything was first class, top quality the whole way through. Yeah, we just have a really good team. This, uh, the, you know, knowing what goes on behind the scenes really will just blow your mind. You think accounting is hard or <laughs> client work is hard, keeping all these logistics going, and it's a lot of you know working with people and labor unions and those sorts of things to keep keep everything going uh, right, but. Uh, Anyway, so behind the scenes was just, it was very smooth this year, and, uh, you know, the, the content, all the instructors were just top-notch. Um, Seth, you did a great job. You got, uh, what is it, third place or second place or something in the Ignite? Second place on the Ignite sessions, which, by the way, I just uh, got the link for you to download. I got the whole thing recorded. Oh, I was so. going to ask if anybody recorded. You got the whole session? Yeah, I, had the whole I would thing. pay for that. So, Seth, describe the Ignite session because you won second place or third place? Second place. Second. First, first place was Leslie Shiner. I was second place. Right. Okay. So, describe what Ignite was. So, Give your Ignite talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was. You have a five. It's a five-minute presentation that's much more difficult to prepare for than a three-hour presentation. And the reason is you have exactly five minutes. It's 20 PowerPoint slides, 15 seconds per slide, and they advance automatically. So you really have to have the whole thing memorized and rehearsed so that you have the timing just right, so that as the slides change, you're in sync with the slides. Very, very difficult. And the fact that you know this is you know, necessary makes it even more nerve-wracking. So it's just, I, I mean, I, I don't know about the other people, the people I spoke with, I got the impression you know, did in fact prepare as much as I did. You know, I, I practiced that thing over and over again, down to the very last hour before the session. I was in my hotel room practicing, you know, 
And it's just it's like anything else. When you need to memorize something really well, you just have to repeat it over and over and over again. And then because you're nervous about getting it right, you tend to be more more prone to slipping and forgetting something or, you know, starting, you know, with the content from one slide but on the wrong slide and, you know, to getting them confused. And so it really took a lot of practice. And, you know, my three-hour session was a breeze compared to this. I was, you know, I was yeah. so nervous getting up there and, and doing it and just wanting to make sure I didn't screw it up. Yeah, because um, you don't have time to correct yourself when it's five. No, yeah, at one three point hours you can say, "Remember what I said? Ignore that." <laughs> yeah. How did you and, well, the thing is, they I didn't know what I was going to be able to see as I was preparing for this. So uh, I, as it worked out, he had, you know, he had them queued up, and he was giving us the presenter view that you just described on PowerPoint for Mac. The only thing that threw me off, and a few others mentioned this, was that. Um, on that, on the Mac version, I guess, because it doesn't do this on the PC version, but on the Mac version, all of a sudden the next slide pops up a few seconds into the current slide. So it's distracting because you're like, oh, wait, did I just miss, did it just advance, you know? And it takes a second. As you're talking, you have to think about this. Mm -hmm. So, but having it there in the long run was a huge help because it was almost like having index cards to refer to to keep myself on point. Right. Um, yeah, and the trick is you can't deviate. You can't deviate from your script. If you do, you're dead in the water. You know, yeah. and so I really did not deviate from any of it. Um, yeah. You know, but in the end, it was so much fun, and a lot of people actually came up to me. I don't know if you heard this, Doug, but a lot of people came up to me and said, "You know what? You should open the conference with the Ignite session because mm -hmm. it was so powerful and so inspiring and motivating." I mean, everybody said that you know they just got such a charge out of hearing all these gems from all these people with so much experience. You know, and then there was me. <laughs> yeah, that was the theme of this Ignite, is uh, taking consulting to the next level. So it was all the instructions we gave each of the speakers is give us some content that talks about how you have built what we consider to be a super successful practice in, in consulting, whether that's QuickBooks consulting or, you know, in Leslie Shiner's case, it's CFO outsource uh, kind of thing. So it doesn't really matter what business you're in, but we've identified you guys as successful. Tell us, tell the audience, what you think are the reasons why you're succeeding. And uh, it was just, it was fantastic. And as far as going to open the conference or something like that, um, one, I, I wasn't thinking that, but I was thinking putting it into a, a general session. So yeah. you'd have 800 people there listening to you. Right, and by the way, uh, Deborah Pilsheimer is watching. Um, Hi, Deborah. Deborah, if you're still watching, you should be able to join us now. If you refresh your page or just kind of refresh your whole feed, you should see an option to join Hangout because I added you to the circle that you should be in. But uh, she's made a few comments as we're talking here um, from back to the beginning. I guess in terms of the conference, uh, we're talking at the beginning about, you know, the level of expertise, I guess, or the, you know, the level of the uh, content. Um, yeah. and she, she wrote, don't change this. I love this. This is a highlight for me. She says, this is my first time in Hangout. How can I get in? Um, and then she's talking about your um, the tribute they did for you. So she writes, made me cry too. It was fabulous. And yeah. she goes on to say, it was the best conference ever. The Ignite session was one of the highlights of the conference. Yeah, it really was. Dennis, you were trying to get, get yeah, in. Yeah, I was going to wonder. I mean, I've given PowerPoint presentations. How did you practice keeping on task with the slides? I mean, did you have help? Somebody was advancing them for you? Did you do it yourself? Or? No, I set up the timing. You, you can program the slides to automatically advance oh. based on whatever interval you want. So I set up the 15 second timings on my slides and I oh. just press, you know, at first I practiced just sitting at the computer until I felt like I got it down. Then when I felt a little comfortable with it, I actually would hit the start button and then stand up, you know, to really emulate the way it was going to be when I actually spoke in front of an audience and try as much as possible to wean myself off of having to look at the notes. Okay. And, you know, the more I repeated it, the better I got with it and eventually got to a point where I could have done it completely ad lib, you know, without looking at any notes if I had to. And I, and I wanted to make sure I was prepared for that in case that was, in fact, what the setup was going to be. Okay. So, you yeah. know, because I knew I was nervous that it was. And I, I couldn't even tell you. I mean, I, it's a five-minute... Um, you know, presentation, so every run-through was five minutes long, and I probably spent several hours collectively practicing. Yeah. You know, so 
Chitch, no, it was smooth. It was very smooth. <laughs> yep. So, and, and you know, you could you could you could kind of tell from watching them who had really practiced and, and who had it. But most of them, I think, if there were 13 of us in total, I'd say 12 out of the 13 of them were excellent. Yeah. You know? Yeah, there could have been well, that 10 means winners. one wasn't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there could have been 10 winners um, because really it was hard. As I was watching, I was like, oh, geez. Every in fact, we, we did an audible in the middle of it. There was going to be one winner, and then sort of somewhere along the middle, Ed Kless from Sage was hosting. He goes, you know what? We just realized there's there can't just be one winner here, so there's going to be four, and uh, so everybody gets four votes, and he just did this. Well, audit. apparently that was Leslie Shiner's suggestion. Leslie had made that suggestion, so I think that's what he said. So yeah. it was um, a, good, a good idea because it would have been really a bummer. <laughs> How about no dogfight? Uh oh, dogfight. <laughs> Zena and Ralphie go at it once in a while, and apparently that's what just happened. And it's always Zena's fault. Just tell her to relax. Well, Zena's alpha. So she she talks with like the mom, to... and the mom always gets the last word. <laughs> yeah, well, that's why she's yeah. alpha. So, don't oh. Ralphie. Don't Ralphie. Ralphie. Asserting her dominance. <laughs> yeah, and Ralphie used to be more timid about it, but now he fights back, and his old age is getting cranky. <laughs> Yeah. So, anyway, so what was it like from the audience's perspective? Because I, I know I'm dying to know, you know, what the experience is like watching it. Uh, it's choppy again, Seth. Maybe it's your. Sorry, mic. I'm saying I'm. Oops, sorry, Ralph. You want to know what it's like from the audience? Yeah. Well. What's it like from the audience's perspective? Well, from my perspective, it was nervous. I, I, I was nervous, right? For each of you, I was like, ah, I hope they do well, you know, because I knew. How hard every, you know, you what you said, Seth. You said this was harder than anything I've ever done. Everybody said Leslie was freaking out, and she was the winner, right? Yeah. Each person had more stress on this than their than anything they've done. So I was nervous in that way, but no, it was just great. One after another, you knew it was going to be good. There's some that were humorous, some that were really serious. There was one guy that did, you know, what was it? Uh, the theory of the universe, or something. <laughs> that was great. That yeah. was, wasn't great. that Matt Clark? Yeah, there yeah, was. Uh, yeah, that was. That was. I mean, it was definitely interesting. You definitely have to have read some of the same literature that he reads, clearly, to uh, you know, to follow along with that one. Well, for sure. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's a great example of. It doesn't really matter what you want to talk about. Do do something that's really interesting, and uh, make it good for the audience. So. Uh, anyway, it was really, really neat. Yeah, I'm doing a uh, hour and a half presentation tomorrow on Obamacare for a CPA group. Really? Uh, my title is Obamacare Solution or Dumpster Fire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And well, so, uh, so uh, we had a, a healthcare uh, session as well, and it was. Um, uh, we had a guy come in from Insperity, which is the big company that's an employee outsourcing HR firm, and he presented it. But we also had Robert Lazan, CPA, who's in our group, and many of you maybe know him. He presented uh, on um, church accounting or something. He had his own session. But he came in and uh, shared this healthcare session. So we went at it from two angles, you know, sort of the, the facts about what it is, which was the Insperity guy, and then what – accountants need to know about it, like what to start telling your clients. So are you going after what you're telling your clients? Uh, I'm going to talk about um, the history of health care, the essentials of Obamacare, um, how it impacts individuals, how it impacts businesses, um, maybe alternatives such as single-payer system and maybe Republican alternatives, and then my my snarky comments at the end. Okay, cool. <laughs> and... Um, so you had to rewrite it all just yesterday, right? <laughs> well, um, yeah, that's the problem. The numbers keep moving. It's like I don't really see how Obama's solution is any kind of solution at all. No, that's I mean, not going to work. But the, the best description I heard was that he's trying to use the insurance industry as a flak jacket for, you know, for himself because it's, he's going to try to blame the insurance companies for not uh, right. extending the policies. Right. Well, I heard somebody say. 
in 30 days from now, everybody has to be signed up. And in 30 days now, as of yesterday, all the insurance companies that, that were forced by the law to cancel all those other policies, they now have to, they can't elect to or not, but they That's have right. to uncancel everything, redo all their doctor lists, redo all their premium settings and all that stuff in order to not cancel because they were going on, the train was moving. That's why they're trying to sort of skunk well, what's really interesting too. about that is Obama made such a clear and distinct promise that everybody's going to be able to keep the policy they have if they like it, and yet the law is apparently written such that insurance companies were forced to cancel policy. So right. it's a direct conflict. And then he tried to backpedal on that more recently, saying that, oh, well, you're going to get better policies than what you had before. And it's, it's like, oh, yeah. you know, nobody can trust anything that any of these people say. And I'm not yeah. just talking about Obama. I, just, yeah. I, I swear to God, as soon as somebody tells me, that, you know, that if you come up to me on the street and say I'm a politician, I'm immediately not going to trust you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because you can't. They're just all full of it. Yeah. Well, the whole essence of it is that if you want to get rid of pre-existing conditions and uh, lifetime payment caps, you're going to have to expand the insurance pools to get younger people in. Right. And the only way you're going to do that is force people to do it because most people left to their own devices only buy insurance when they need it. Right. So, but the, the dirty little secret is the IRS can't enforce the penalty. They can take it out of your refund, but they can't come after you. So if you're smart, you'll just withhold less money. Yeah. And that way... <laughs> But even still, 95 bucks is nothing. It's a lot cheaper than buying a policy. But it, it, but it escalates over the years. It's 95 yeah, it bucks in the first year, then it gets more. Within about three years, it will be a lot no, more cost no, it's, effective it's, to have the insurance. It won't be a lot. No, it's the greater of $95 or 1% of your uh, income. Oh, the greater? So, yeah. Oh, so it could be higher. And it's like, but like I said, the IRS has there's no enforcement mechanism. They can't. Collect, they can't. So if you didn't get a refund. Well, well, yeah, they can take out your refund. But if you if you manage your affairs as such that you don't get a refund, I mean, you you have less withheld. Right. There's really no way they can you know come after you unless you should be doing it anyway. Right. Yeah, that's what. I, yeah, I mean, you really can give them an industry loan. But the only way, the only thing I'm concerned about is can they go in and recharacterize your your pay payments to them, like saying, guess what, you thought this was a you know, tax payment, tax yeah. payment, an yeah. estimated payment, yeah. and it's not. You're going to recharacterize it as a payment on the penalty. You yeah. know, I, I haven't gotten a straight answer yet on that. I'm yeah. going to an IRS. So, so Dennis, I can. So, so Dennis, I'm okay. your client, and I'm coming to you for tax prep day, and you're going to ask me, Doug, do you have health care insurance? And I'm going to say, that's none of your business. What do you do? <laughs> um, don't you have to? It's the say, way they're going to enforce. Or I do or don't? You know the way they're supposed to enforce it is on the 1040 for next year, 2014. Right. And I have no idea what that's going to look like. Um, I have no idea if it's going to change again. I mean, it's just kind of a, a theoretical thing right now. I mean, they post. You know, one thing that's kind of interesting is that they postpone the employer mandate for yeah two, a year. So what happens if the employers decide? not to offer health insurance, they're going to dump all these people on the exchanges this year because there's no penalty this year, but this, they still have the individual mandate for the uh, the people. Right. So, I mean, that hasn't been really answered either. I mean, there's all these all these questions out there. It's kind of like you pull on a, a string on a suit and the sleeve falls off, you know, it's like... Yeah. It's a but good my basic attitude is if not Obamacare, then what? Well, you know, right. You know, I mean, it's easier to amend something than just, you know, if you're waiting for perfection, you'll wait forever. So I well, don't I, I mean, that's debatable because what that what what now you have is, like I said, in the case of the cancellations versus no need to cancel, all the insurance company had to obey, and so now they had to do this thing where they had to cancel policies that were in compliance, and they had to then completely redo all their their ratings and all their doctor lists and all yeah. the benefit structures and all that. So that was a huge huge, huge undertaking for all the insurance companies. Exactly. So you say it's easier to amend something that, well, I... I'm, I'm talking about Obamacare in terms of, you know, n not having anything as opposed to trying to fix things, you know, let it see how it plays out. My, you know, some people think it's a Trojan horse for a single-payer system. Yeah. Because it's such a Rube Goldberg, you know, contraption that... Yeah, it, it, yeah. Um, 
the, the other thing you said is uh, that they were canceling these policies because they were going to get a better policy. You know, the reason According to whom? Well, they what think you, your what, policy is what you want, and it's what you decide versus them. Well, what the fine print is is that you could keep your policy as long as there were no changes, which is just about impossible. Right. And anybody that had read the law or chose to read the law, you know, could have, you know, brought that out a year ago. But right. it's such a confusing. I mean, I've taken like 16 hours on this, and I'm still confused about it. You know, it's just like. Right. Especially the tax. I mean, as a tax preparer, I have the uh, unenviable position of telling the client that, hey, guess what? You uh, you took too much on a credit, and so now you're going to pay some of it back. And given the problems with the exchanges, who knows what kind of information you're you're getting sent to the insurance companies? Right. And the calculator is such a black box that no one really kind of understands how that works. You know, so I can see that. This whole thing is just going to be a real. I agree. It's not going to be simple. It's not going to be something you can say, okay, let's just write this thing and push the button and it's all going to work right away. Of course, it's going to be some tweaking. And Deborah right. is still watching. She writes, I believe they want to do the right thing. Something this big is bound to have glitches and problems getting it implemented. Imagine getting Medicare and Social Security implemented today. You know, now yeah. that's pretty streamlined, although it's going really yeah. bankrupt. Um, yeah. And then in terms of the. Uh, I guess what you were talking about a few minutes ago, sure, I say get a tax document, don't they? That's how they have to tell their tax preparer. Tax preparer don't ask about coverage, it's just you have it. Right. Well, when I was in the corporate world, I was on this database project, and it was called PETA, you know, Property Inspection Tracking and Analysis, but it really stood for pain in the ass database. <laughs> it was like 10 times over budget and a year behind schedule, and they kept threatening us with the day of reckoning because. Once the senior exec found out how bad we were botching the the system, you know, the program, that we'd be in big trouble anyway. They changed executives about 80 percent way through the the project, and so not only did we escape the day of reckoning, we were able to kind of shamelessly spin it as a heroic success. But you know, it's the politics of this kind of stuff, you know, these projects, and I can just imagine that the pressure these people were under to try to get this thing out the door, and so just kind of shoving it through and Hoping for the best, you know, on this. And I, I've read that they may not be able to fix it before for another couple of months because it's so screwed up with all the different systems trying to talk to each other. Well, it's certainly a mess. I know uh, <laughs> a lot of the large corporations, um, for example, I retired from IBM, and they took the opportunity of uh, dumping their. They never made it finally. Sorry, Larry. Sorry, Larry. De Deborah's famous, so we had to recognize her right away. Okay. Go, Larry. I said uh, this whole healthcare thing is is really a stinking mess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of the large corporations I see have taken this opportunity to dump the benefits off on. Uh, exchanges, whether private or what, and that's what IBM did, and um, ever since, I've been, <laughs> been fighting with those folks, uh, the exchange folks, to get it straight. My wife also um, retired from IBM, and, you know, we have, like, separate accounts, and um, these people always try to combine it for some reason, but uh, <laughs> it, it's a mess. Yeah. My, my uh, sort of theory here is just be careful what you wish for. When you wish for something to get better uh, and then you tell the government to fix it, so big, big organizations where you send them all your money and then they fix it, this is inevitably what happens, you know, as opposed to kind of giving us more control about how we how we spend and how we how we buy. That's just a fundamental sort of political difference, I suppose, that occurs that is going on right now. But my point about be careful about giving the government all this power is wait until the guy in charge is not your guy. Yeah. Then you're gonna hate life. Whatever whatever side you're on, if you right. give him power and then then your guy is no longer in power, now what? Well, in my Toastmaster group, there's a couple from Russia, and they were sort of regaling us with their experiences with the single-payer system in Russia, and 
you know, you could never get anything, you know, get, you know, they didn't have appointments, so you get there and there'd be crowds of people there. And I was talking to a client that's from Canada, and she's saying that with Canada, if people want to get something done quickly, they go to the United States. So I mean, there's no panacea with, you know, right. with this, and I don't really know. If there's an answer that's going to make everybody happy, probably not. Well, you know, right no, now, when when you don't have health insurance and you need to have something done, people are going to the emergency room. Right. And that's what's really killing me is, you know, if when I have to really go to the emergency room for a, an actual emergency, I gotta wait for a sea of people to get through. I know they do triage system and they, you know, prioritize, but it's really, really frustrating. Yeah. And you could get well, bumped. I mean, if, if somebody comes in that's been wounded in a drug fight or something, you know, they go to the top of the... Right. I, I'm just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I would get, predict that that won't change, Tina. When we go to the emergency, I bet it won't get any better. It might get worse. Yeah, no, I don't that's know. That's probably about the cost, too, because somebody's got to pick up the tab for that. If the person coming into the emergency room doesn't have insurance to cover, and the hospital's not going to throw them out on the street, that would be that's completely right. inhumane. They never have. So either the hospital's going to eat the cost, and what are they going to have to do as a result? They're going to have to charge more, right? So the right. people who are paying ultimately have to pay for the ones who can't. And I don't think you're ever going to get around that one way or another. That I right. agree with Doug. That's always going to be the case. Yeah. Is that the, you know, and it's interesting because right in my own household, it's, it's an interesting perspective because, you know, I've been paying for private insurance for my wife and I for years, and it's costing an arm and a leg. You know, I think we're up to almost $1,200 a month is what I pay for the two of us to have Kaiser, which is one of the best in the, in the world, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what's happening is as this um, Obamacare plan unfolds, we're looking at options where I could probably actually get insurance much cheaper for my wife and possibly even for myself, so we can save money there. But as a small business owner, if I start hiring employees and I have to pick up the tab for their health insurance, that's going to cost me a lot more. And now you're going to see what happened when they first started talking about this a few years back, where companies are going to hold off on hiring because they can't be clear on what the financial impact will be, what's it going to cost me to actually hire an employee above and beyond the salary itself. I don't know what the health insurance implications are going to be. And so a lot of companies, especially if they're on a tight budget, are going to be very afraid to hire, which is going to cause unemployment rates to go up again because nobody's going to want to hire until they're clear on what the true impact is. Right. So, so Seth, can you help Deborah? Maybe she needs to be taught how to unmute. Uh, Deborah, don't forget, if you move your mouse around on the actual Hangout screen, controls will appear at the top, and you'll see an option to unmute your microphone. Maybe she doesn't have a mic. Oh. Talk to us. <laughs> Wait, no, because I think her sound's working because her image is coming up. Yeah. She's trying. I hear There's some little crackly cog crackle. crackle. There's a little cogwheel at the top, Deborah. And look at that little cogwheel. There's ways to tell it what your microphone is and all that stuff. Yeah, if, you, if you've unmuted the microphone icon, then click on the cogwheel like Doug said, and you'll see... Uh, your uh, audio settings, your default uh, microphone device. Yeah, you can, yeah. <laughs> she feels so foolish. <laughs> Just hover, <laughs> hover your mouse at the top of Seth's head right now. Yep. And you'll see the, the icons show up. All right, we'll keep going, Seth. So, uh, no, I mean, you know, it's end of rant. It's just, um, I, I remember seeing this happen. And it's funny, <coughs> I had an argument with somebody. Um, I was at a, it was actually a Burbank Chamber of Commerce thing. And the subject came up, because this was when they were first starting to talk about Obamacare and what the implications might be, and the fact that employers were going to have to carry insurance for all employees, regardless, and, you know, and what it was going to cost. And that was unclear. And I remember this lady saying to me, well, if you just hire people who do a great job and they're going to increase the bottom line, then you shouldn't have to worry about that. And I, I felt like smacking her, <laughs> yeah. saying, saying, you know, what world, what planet do you live on? Because I live on planet Earth where reality sets in, and, you know, as much as that might sound great in theory, not every employee directly produces revenue. Some employees are admin employees, and... You know, it's, it's, again, when I don't know, when I'm, when I don't know what the true cost is going to be from hiring somebody because I don't know how much I'm going to have to pay for health insurance on each person, it becomes really difficult to plan and budget, which means I become very hesitant to hire somebody until I feel like I can be clear about yeah. that. Because the last thing I want to do is hire somebody, 
and then find out what the real implications are and realize I can't afford them and have to let them go. Yeah, that's worse. Deborah, yeah. I think we can hear you. Yeah, Deborah, say something. Talk to us. Sing. You can hear me? There yeah, you are. You. Hey, Deborah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Okay, keep talking. Just ignore me in the background here. <laughs> the award-winning Deborah Kilsheimer has arrived. <laughs> All right. Oh, speaking of awards. <laughs> oh, is Seth getting his certification? Doug, wow. I think that's a direct result of the Sleater Conference. That's right. That's, that's what that's Seth reward. was inspired to do. Shame him okay. into it. Check it out. What is Magnificent it? Magnificent Member Award, Social Media Maven. Oh, uh, that's different. Yeah. We prefer the term social media badass. <laughs> <laughs> we actually debated on the word Maven because we weren't sure that it was a masculine and feminine, uh, you know, noun. So uh, we're not sure, but hopefully you won't be offended. And Deborah Kilsheimer has one of those too, but she can't show it to us. What did you win, Deborah? Or, Jolly, I won Jolly Jester. Jolly Jester. <laughs> so I want to say you guys did not win. You were recognized by your peers for your excellence. Well, my husband said I got I got the class clown award. <laughs> I said, no, I'm the most fun accountant you'll ever meet. <laughs> fun, but I also want to say, Deborah, you're also one of the most talented. I see what you post in our network forums. I see how you answer people. You've always got really good answers for people, so... We like well, I, only, I only answer the ones I know the answers to. <laughs> okay, well, that's that's, that's a, a good idea. trick. <laughs> that's a good secret. <laughs> a lot of people, a lot of people don't. I have discovered. Yeah, you no, know. a lot of people like. Not you in the Twitter group, but in other forums that I participate in. That, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I, really, I was quite honored and humbled by being selected. So that was really something. Thank you all. Yeah. So, so Gina, we're getting you there next time. Dennis, I think it's about time for you to come back. <laughs> I heard my name was mentioned from some sources that. Uh, probably. Yeah, I no, you, I think it was mentioned when we talked about the Seattle contingent of the Sleater Group. Oh, I did. Yeah. Was uh, let's see. Um, Shelley Long was there, and there, there's a whole crew. Or Shelly Robbins. Which is Shelly Robbins, sorry. Shelly Long and Michelle Long got married. And, uh, <laughs> I, guess, uh, I guess Michelle Long speaking. We're having a What's New with QuickBooks on next Tuesday. And I guess Michelle Long is going to be teaching. I think it's like a certification uh, deep dive or something. Yep. Next, uh, yeah, and uh, Gail, was Gail Kurse up there? Yes, she was. She gave a... Uh, uh, an Ignite talk that was really good. Yeah, she's uh, really talented. How about Beth Damas? Beth was there, wasn't she? she Beth was there. Was there. Yeah, Beth yeah. was there. She was, she was the goddess of office supplies. Yeah. <laughs> office supplies. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, she's quite a Tell us about that, Deborah. Well, the banquet, you know, to me is the Academy Awards of the uh, of my year. So I dress up every year for that. And Beth came this year as the goddess of office supplies. <laughs> I, I went as this as a sleeterator. Because <laughs> it was a toga theme, and uh, she yeah, had who a hat. else was there from Who else was there from Seattle? Was uh, Keith Gormanzano there, or is he? I, no, Keith wasn't there this year. No. He wasn't there. Mm. How about Mike Branch? Was he there? Mike was yes. there. Okay. Uh, he wasn't at the banquet, though. I don't know why. But, okay. huh. Or at least I didn't see him. Did you guys? I don't. Maybe I. Missed I him. Oh no, I don't remember if I saw him or not. Yeah. I didn't we, see him we, at the banquet. You guys missed laser karaoke. We all got up and sang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what'd you sing, Seth? I wish I had a tape of that, Seth. <laughs> I sang a duet with Elaine Morgan, who's from Canada, um, and originally from Scotland. And she, I never knew that. I've known her for years online, but I'd never heard her speak because I mainly talked to her on Twitter. Um, and she's at Balance Sheets CA, and the CA is Canada, not California. Um, but she's at Balance Sheets CA on Twitter, and she's just a wonderful person. She's and and she's she's got that thick Scottish accent, which is a pleasure to listen to. Um, and just and she's great. So she asked me to do a to sing a Don't Go Breaking My Heart together with her. So I gave <laughs> it my best, Elton John. Cool. It was great. It was great. You guys know Clayton Oates, our Aussie contingent, 
Yes. Um, his there. wife and, and the rest of the Aussies got up and uh, sang uh, something down under, for the, the man down under. Uh, well, the Men at Work song. It's, yeah. it's called Land yeah. Down Under. The land Down Under. joining us, except that right now it's 3.47 a.m. in Sydney, Australia. Yeah, so he's probably not going to repeat that for us today. <laughs> so he's not going to be joining us. But he is just awesome. He won fourth place in the Ignite session. So it was Leslie, then myself, and then um, Pat. Was it? Uh, no. Um, why can't I think of her name now? How can I not remember her? The one who overcame being shy. Oh, yeah. Mary, Long, Mary Longacre. Mary Longacre. Yes, Mary Longacre. Longacre. I'm sorry. So she was third, and then um, and Clayton was fourth. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but he was he's awesome. I love that guy. And uh, he and I are actually starting to talk about how we can do some work together. He's got a a great little um, subscription service where he they offer like weekly tips, and I think I'm going to join forces with him and make video versions of the tips, and we're going to offer that out for a monthly fee between the two of us. So. That should be exciting. Cool. Nice. And uh, speaking of upcoming events, because we started talking about that a couple minutes ago, um, Doug and I are going to be joining together on an upcoming Zero webinar on marketing, right? December 12th. December 12th, and it should be 11 a.m. That's still tentative, but we'll blast out. 12, 12 at 11. Yep. 12, 12 at 11. <laughs> Pacific. <laughs> so, and I don't know if you guys noticed, but earlier this week we had 11, 12, 13 as mm -hmm. a date. I hope you all caught that and made a wish. And that was Maybe. my brother's birthday, so we all knew about that. All right. I, I caught it. I didn't know the wish part. <laughs> <laughs> Better yet, buy a lottery million. ticket. <laughs> yeah, Mega Millions is big this week. I should have darn. <laughs> See? Just oh, take it. I learned something else important at the conference, and that is Sarah is very tall, and her husband is tall, too. Yeah, Sarah, <laughs> so, can you stand up? Would you mind? Because I n had no idea. I was like, what the, where did that come from? <laughs> so I look up and keep looking up. <laughs> we look up to you, Sarah. No, so is Charlie Russell. Well, That's I know Charlie. Like, yeah, I look up at Charlie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. By the way, hopefully you guys are watching the uh, blog, sleeter.com slash blog, because Charlie has been um, doing lots of posts. Uh, oh, he's a busy man. Yeah, and um, and so is Greg. We're, we're, we're trying to basically write up what happened, uh, big events at the conference. So we learned a lot about, from Brad Smith, CEO of Intuit, talking about the direction that Intuit is going in. And there was uh, a lot of uh, firecrackers right after his talk, so Charlie wrote those up. Um, it, it appeared that Intuit was going to stop supporting or investing in QBPoS. And that's what we heard, and so all the POS people got really uh, excited, whatever. Uh, what the clarification later was from Dan Wernickoff is we're just not going to... Um, uh, take the POS product that you see today and enable that for QBO. So they're going to continue. And I got to tell you, I got that right away from his talk. I don't know. I honestly don't know how others missed that because I th that's exactly what I took out of it was the questions preceding that were all about QuickBooks Online. So to me, it followed very logically that that's what he was saying is that we're not going to go there. We're not going to link it with QB Online. Right. I was right. on a webinar yesterday on in, into a tax online. And they just released a new interface, and it looks remarkably like the Harmony version of QBO. Yeah, well, Harmony is something that's across the product line. And now I'm yeah, I'm told don't call it QuickBooks Online Harmony. It's just the new QuickBooks Online that yeah. Stacy Kildall set me straight on that during the conference. Yeah, that Harmony was just like a code word, if you will, for no. what they're doing to redo the interface, and and it really is not product specific. It's really about I think doesn't it refer to their whole small business operating system where the whole entire platform is meant to bring Harmony across all the platforms yeah. and. Yeah, well, so it's not just how it looks, but also how they interact with each other. Yeah, and the it's Intuit a long it. process. It's not like boom, it's all done. Yeah, the Intuit Tax Online, the demo they gave us, it refreshed a lot faster than the previous version. But you could see the the common branding look, the look and feel of it. You know. and, and by the way, I have to make this. This is a very important announcement. I can't believe I almost forgot to make this announcement. But it's official this week that I am now QuickBooks certified. 
<laughs> and all these about guys. that a little bit when you went and got your award. Congratulations, Seth. I finally got QuickBooks certified. I, in fact, I have QuickBooks online certification and desktop certification now. So next, I got to do the enterprise certification and then the advanced certification. We have and to QuickBooks 2014 uh, certification is coming out the end of this month. Yeah, no, I figured that would be next. So and now, so now I can I'm allowed back into the National Advisory Network. So I, it's funny I because it, it was a funny thing that came up. They when when it came time to renew my membership there, um, I got an email from you know one of the women that works for Joe and and saying, hey Seth, we can't find any record of your uh, certification. Can you provide that to us? I said, as a matter of fact, I can't because I don't have it. Never did and. You know, just haven't had the time and haven't bothered. So, you know, it was a, they were very amicable about it. They were very nice. They just said, look, you know, unfortunately, it's a requirement. You have to be certified, so we can't, you know, uh, let you stay. So I sent the copies of my certificates to them this week saying, let me in, let me in. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, so that's so my story. Seth, Seth great. Uh, look at the chat between Tina and me, the last two. Uh Charlie's busy following up with those who unsubscribe to the email blog notifications. I unsubscribe because I follow us on social media. He emailed me to make sure I wasn't unhappy with the emails for some reason. So you unsubscribe from the blog and follow us via links from social media. Yes. Okay. So my question to you is help us uh, understand as publisher, uh, publishers of information who uh, when you get subscribers you can track so much. But mm -hmm. Tina's scenario is very, I think, the new world. She mm -hmm. doesn't want emails uh, sent to her. She's going to look at her social media feed, and she wants to click there to get into our stuff. For her, it's the same. She's going to get a notification. But for us, we can't track it. How do we track it better? Okay, so it's an interesting concept. The other thing is that uh, a lot of people will use a feed reader, right? Like yeah. Google Reader, which is now gone. So we, most people went to Feedly from there. I use something I like called NetVibes. So, yeah, I don't want to subscribe to a blog because I, I get enough emails. We talk about that all the time and how, you know, I think in the next few years we're going to see more and more situations where those conversations we're trying to keep track of, we're going to do away with email for that purpose and we're going to use things like Zoho Projects or other forum, cloud-based forum software to keep track of important conversations so you can have threaded, nested conversations that are important. The point being, we're tired of getting emails and our email is like a junkyard of digital junk. So I don't want to get those emails from the blog. It's enough I get, you know. So the question is on the flip side of that, how do I track it? It's a good question. As the I think, publisher. Yeah, as the publisher, how do I track it? Who's reading? Why are they reading or why are they not reading? And you know what my answer is? Convert it to a newsletter subscription. Send out a newsletter because what you can do is you can summarize the posts that came out in the blog this week in the newsletter with links back to your blog. and then But then build a newsletter subscriber list based on that. And, mm -hmm. and and along those lines, the more I watch what the big e you know internet marketing guys are doing, the Chris Brogans and the Chris Perillos, and if your name is Chris, you're just gonna skyrocket <laughs> on social media apparently, because um, there's Chris Brogan, Chris Perillo, Chris Voss. There's a million Chris's out there. Anyway, I digress. Um, uh, you'll see that when they, with, what. Only one Seth. There's only one Seth. Well, there's also um, there's Seth another. MacFarlane, but he's not really a blogger per se, so <laughs> so he doesn't count. He's just a clown so, on TV. So Seth, though, you do track um, social media, so you would capture it there. You just wouldn't have user specific. But you don't know out of your followers who's following you to get the blog updates and who's just following you for general stuff. That's, I think, the you know what what people who publish blogs want to know is who's reading my blog? How many visitors are coming there, and how are they getting there? Are they getting there because they're subscribed, or are they getting there because of organic search engine results? You know, you you right. want to track this stuff to see what's most effective. And you know what I'll do? I'll also, I'm gonna I'm gonna spoil it for you, Doug, because I'm gonna I'm gonna pick up on something that Gary Vaynerchuk preaches a lot, which is let go of the numbers. <laughs> As much as we want to track and we want to see how much am I getting and how much does it, how much did it cost me to get all this traffic and how much traffic did I get and where did it come from, yeah. his whole thing is forget the numbers. We get too hung up on that stuff and then we get caught up and obsessed with it and yeah. then we get stuck. Instead of just publishing really good content and focusing on that and trusting that the numbers will follow, it's kind of like what I talked about at Ignite. My essential message with regard to making money was do what you love and the money will follow. It's well, the same thing here. Publish what you love and the followers will follow. Okay. 
Okay, so two things about that. I completely agree. I hate the whole analysis paralysis we do as accountants where we look at financial statements that we can't do anything about and so forth. We're looking at dead, dead debits and credits all the time for a living as opposed to uh, continuing to push out new great things. However, if you ever want to monetize uh, something like a readership in a magazine or blog situation, you need to be able to tell your advertisers how many people are are are, are viewing them. So it's a number that that you that, that, that determines your value uh, for for advertisement. So well, sure, and and but you can still track and give them those statistics, but uh, you don't necessarily need to know that you know those statistics are people who are subscribed to the blog, right? You just need to know. That we have this many visitors coming to the blog each month, and that it's increasing each month, and here's how many unique visitors we have each month, and that information is easily attainable. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, because again, it, you know, talking about the social media side of it, you know, we, we get hung up, and you know, like Gary Vaynerchuk will be the first one to come out and tell you that I don't care if you have ten thousand followers or ten followers, because it might be that the ten followers you have are so much more valuable than the other nine thousand nine hundred and ninety. That you could have because the 9,990 really don't care about you specifically or what you're sharing. They may have followed you for any number of the wrong reasons, but you've got these 10 followers who are following you because they absolutely can't get enough of what you're putting out there, and yeah. those are the ones you want. And so he put a whole article out a few months ago about how don't discount it just because you only, quote unquote, have 10 followers. It's oh. a really bad way to think. Right, actually now. Except for the advertisers who now need a new way of qualifying who they're going to pay how much for. Well, yeah. and you know, it's funny. Here's my here's my rant on that for a minute because <laughs> my thing was I got kicked out of Google's AdSense advertising program a while back. Bad boy. <laughs> they don't tell you what you did wrong. They just tell you you're doing something wrong and they kick you out. And I was in the end so glad they did because I don't want advertisers. I don't care about the advertisers. In the end, I made the decision that I had to adopt and overcome. And so in the process of adopting and overcoming, I decided... F the advertisers. I don't care about the advertisers. I'd rather sell my own products than someone else's anyway. So I'm going to use my social media presence, A, to do what I first and foremost set out to do, which is to provide really good information to people, and B, to sell my own products and services. And I don't care about anybody else's other than maybe my colleagues who I'm here to support all the time. But So I don't care about not having advertisers and what they want to pay. Well, I get you can say that, Seth because of your business plan, but there are a lot of different businesses that have different business plans. So I completely support you for you. It's sure. just that in general, uh, when you talk about a business that's trying to you know, monetize a blog, you, 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 you're going to need to give these numbers, and you are going to take... And like, again, if you really keep just putting top. really good content out there, the numbers will follow. It will grow. You will get, as long as your stuff is good and valuable and unique, and it doesn't even have to be that unique. No, it just has to be good. Yeah, the point is, you can't get the numbers. Yeah, if the point is, no, the point isn't about the numbers. It's about the, if you're going to have a business model that says, we have this many readers and therefore you pay this much based on that number. That's the whole point. I have and a, you're saying, I don't want that. Well, fine, but some other companies I'm do. Not, I'm not saying I don't want that. I'm saying it's not the most important thing. I'm saying that, right. in fact, speaking of the advertisers, and you know, to your point specifically, I would love to be able to go to the advertiser and say, hey, you know what? I have 10,000 followers. Maybe you're not accustomed to advertising with people who don't have at least 50,000 followers, right? right? But look at the engagement factor of my 10,000 followers. My content is so good that I have people constantly commenting on my posts. I have people constantly resharing, retweeting, posting. and So the more engaged my audience is, that's much more valuable to an advertiser than a sheer number. Right, and so if you're I can, arguing for quality as opposed to quantity, and I definitely without a doubt. completely agree. And that's why if you look at the Sleater group, you look at everybody in this hangout here, these are quality people that may be 10 of us, but 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 the, us 10 have more impact on uh, the, the the marketplace than, than 100 others. So uh, that quality versus quantity, I completely agree. So it was just the one point about the different business models for these different things where we do have to track. So my thing is, you said do a newsletter built, but like Tina said, a lot of people don't want to 
read newsletters either because that's just yet another email too. The other thing I think you would agree with is I could put into my social media links that are trackable through Buffer or whatever, right? Um, yes, you can use uh, well. You can use Bitly links that are trackable to find out, you know, who's clicking on, you know, because a, a Bitly link is only created once. No matter how many different people put the full URL in, it's the same Bitly link. So you can actually see all the stats for that Bitly link to see how many people are clicking on it to come over to wherever right. it points. Can you track on track Twitter? I mean, if you put a link in Twitter, can you, can that be tracked? Well, you yeah, you use a Bitly shortened link uh, in okay. your tweet, and so that way, when they click on that, it tracks through Bitly. You know, that's how. Oh, okay. But Buffer can do that too, right? Buffer will well when you're in Buffer in the setup, you have to choose your link shortening service. One of your choices is Bitly, and there's a couple ah, others. So, ah, so and so generally speaking, with any of these apps that work with Twitter or Facebook, there's a, a choice in terms of the link shortening service that you can use, and Bitly is almost always one of them. So it's a great it's a great yeah, one to use. We've used that forever. What what you're talking about is the difficulty in all this counting, right? Yes. Yeah. Which we're so good at. Yeah. <laughs> well, all right, the other thing I wanted to say, in terms of the newsletter, um, I, I mean, I, I get, um, I thought what I saw Tina say was that uh, she says I'm less likely to read a newsletter when reviewing social media. And that's true of a lot of people. But I will tell you that the marketing experts say that email marketing is still the most effective, more so than anything else, more so than any social media. Because yeah. what you're getting is you're getting people who have specifically, assuming you do it right, right? Assuming you don't just put people on your list. Assuming yeah. you're, you're emailing people who have actually opted in on their own, then what you've got is a highly engaged audience who actually are going out of their way to mm -hmm. add yeah. more email into their inundated email inbox because right. they're that interested in what you have to offer. But the other trick is, a lot of us, because of the way these email marketing uh, programs are designed to, you know, lead us to think, I think, um, is that we want to put these glorious-looking newsletters with all these graphics and wonderful things. And if you look at the experts, when I look at the email newsletter I get from Chris Brogan or Melissa Galt or Chris Perillo, it's a very plain text email, almost no different than the email I might write to you to say, "Hey, Doug, how's it going today?" and it's interesting to me that the more I watch and pay attention to you know the experts and how they do it, the more I notice that this is what they're all doing. They write simple, plain text emails. There's no graphics. There might be some hyperlinks in there, yeah. and they'll tell you straight up, "Hey, this is a you know Chris Brogan uses the phrase, this is a selly sell email." So when he's sending an email that specifically has something for sale, he tells you right up front, completely transparent, yeah. and that almost breaks down the barrier. When I get that, right. I'm like, okay, I trust this guy because he's not trying to BS me. So, yeah, I want to read what he has to say because it's a very interesting and different approach than what I'm accustomed to seeing. Yeah. We do something called the Super Sleeter deal, and we send out an email, and that's what it is. So everybody knows, you. okay, here's some deals, but it's about <laughs> selling and buying as opposed to interesting happenings in the, in the industry. Yeah. Right. So, you know, but that's the trick is, and it's hard to do because I, I know I, I, for a while would get really caught up in, oh, but I can't do that. I've got to have the nice picture for somebody to click on to go over to sign up for my real estate site. And eventually I just broke down and said, you know what, I'm just going to go against my instinct and do what these guys are doing because they're the experts. And I found that I got a lot more engagement. I get a lot more people that hit reply when they get my newsletter now because... Did what? what did you do magically that was against your instinct? I stopped putting images and, and I, I went with the most simple plain text format of an email that Constant Contact offers. There's not the only, no, there's no graphics in there. There's no images. It's just plain text. I might embed a video thumbnail because everybody knows my thing is video, but you see that it's a video thumbnail because you see the play button and I know that people want to watch the videos. So that's okay, but there's no like sidelines and graphics and click here and oh, here's our next upcoming event or any of that. Everybody, everybody in here, quickly say you would um, say yes if you prefer prefer the plane that he's talking about as a as a reader or whatever consumer. You're more likely yes if you agree that the more plain is better, or no if you feel uh, that the prettier one is better. But the problem is most 
in your program screen out the, the graphics to begin with. You have to click on a link to see the graphics. And I'll tell you the other difference, Doug, is that when I see the graphics, I know right away it's a newsletter and I'm immediately turned yeah. off because I'm like, I don't have time. But when I see all plain text, it's, it's another email to read and it's much more personal. It's, it feels more personal because it feels more like an email that I would send to a friend of mine. And that's how I write my, e my newsletter too, is I write it as though I'm writing to my best friend and saying, hey, here's what's going on in my world. And I make it very intimate. I share, you know, obviously there's a line still, but I share personal details that I wouldn't necessarily share openly anywhere else. You know, just yeah. about my journey as an entrepreneur. Yeah, well, Deborah's key key point there. I look at pretty, but I read plain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Well, well, that's a good point, though. How, how are they dealing with the... Uh, Gmail promotional tabs getting caught they're, up there. They're watching my video on how to hack those tabs. I have a video called How to Hack the New <laughs> Gmail Tab. So go watch it and make sure you share it with as many people as you can. <laughs> yeah, you, I mean, you, you, can hack, you can hack it not to see it yourself, but a lot of people aren't doing that. So it's a lot of, a lot of people who aren't doing that, all the... Those newsletters are going into that promotional tab. So. Right, but what we're doing as publishers of the newsletters is we're going out to our readers and saying, like I did, and saying, hey, watch this video. If you use Gmail, this is what you need to do to make sure you get my newsletter. Yeah. Michael Stelzner at the Social Media Examiner, as soon as those tabs came out, he did a short video, and I did mine right on the same day, basically. Um, and so all of us, and Chris Brogan sent out a newsletter that day saying, hey, you know, the new Gmail tabs might restrict you from getting my newsletter, assuming you actually want to get it. Here's what you need to do, you know. And so, basically, as the publisher, you have to educate your readers and and assume that they do actually want to get it. And based on that assumption, say, here's what you need to do to ensure that you do get it. Are you talking about where it says promotional or mm -hmm. social? Or yeah, Gmail restructured the look. If you didn't have the setting customized already, it just dropped on you one day when you logged into Gmail, where all these newsletters were going into a promotional tab yeah. and out of the main mm -hmm. inbox. Mm -hmm. Now, Google did that to help its user to filter out the stuff maybe that they didn't necessarily want to see or put it on the side so that I can look at that when I feel like I'm ready to go sit there and read newsletters. But a lot of people never get to that point. They just let it get filtered and then get busy and don't do it. Another smart thing I noticed that Chris Brogan does, and there's a reason why he's so successful with this stuff. So that's why I tend to follow what he does. I look at what he does and I mimic him because it's success it's 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 effective. So um, he sends his newsletter out on Sunday. And, and what I find is that on Sundays, I tend to be at home in the morning, relaxed on my couch with my laptop, and I'm much more inclined to want to read his newsletter then. Smart. My, my problem is I have Gmail when I'm at home and in the morning before I get to work, and I have everything squirreled off into nice little folders, and then I get to work and I've done the same thing in Outlook so I can prioritize my reading, but I've got to click on everything twice. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. Or really... Outlook specifically and email in general is the biggest, biggest problem for product uh, that, that we have to resolve for being more productive in life. Right. Waste more time. I, well, I, and that's I, why I got away from Outlook and yeah. I strictly use Gmail. Well, that's exactly but, why because is Outlook it really that much better. The issue. Yeah, is, it's, it's yes. much better. I don't have to file <laughs> things twice with Outlook. I have to file everything twice. Yeah. I don't use Outlook anymore. I use uh, I don't use Outlook anymore. I use a uh, Google um, Calendar. For my calendar, I don't even bother with Outlook. But, but do you, what do you use for email? Gmail. Okay, yeah. yeah. So there I you mean, have it. I found it. that Outlook was the flakiest Microsoft product I've ever seen. It was, it was always crashing or doing something weird. Yep. Yep. I got out of Outlook years ago. And I really haven't looked back at all. Gmail works beautifully because it's cloud-based. So once I do something in one place, it doesn't matter where else I go log in. It's done. Although Outlook with Exchange will be the same because yeah, that's Office 365 implements all of those. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it does it. But again, Outlook is still downloading all the data to a local location on your hard drive. Whereas Gmail is strictly in the cloud, so there's never any slowdown. It never really freezes up or crashes on me, other than if my browser freezes up and crashes. But that's not Gmail; that's the browser. So, yeah. but Exchange still allows you to keep, you know, it's the synchronized copy between all your devices. So, I mean, just to be clear, it does it does download it, but it keeps it in sync, so that if I do it one place, I can see it the other place. Right. No, I get that. But it, again, with not having anything downloaded at all. It's just a lot more seamless, and it do, I don't, well, you know, it doesn't I mean, weigh down my hard drive. Fair, then you couldn't do anything if you weren't online. 
correct, but I'm never not online. I mean, I well, always have. And more and more, yeah. you're right. That's the case, but just that's the use case why. So if you're on an airplane and they don't have Wi-Fi, you can do your email. Actually, Gmail does have a work offline option. You can work offline. Yep. You can. Yeah, no. Okay. So you can write emails and respond, and then as soon as you get back online, it'll shoot them all out. I wonder... Uh, is it a browser experience for that? Yeah, it's a browser experience, but it just won't stop you because of the fact that you don't have a live internet connection. So you just choose to work offline, and then you can do it, and you won't get interrupted. Right. So anyway, with that, we're about 15 minutes almost over time. So uh, we should wrap it up. What does Deborah say in the chat? If I cannot read it quickly, it gets lost. I do not go back to read too much information it's coming in all day long. What about Office 365? Doesn't that sync all your devices? So yeah, we yes, it that. does. Yes. So yeah, um, but and again, so to, what I really love about Gmail is when I buy my Android phone and I log into my Google account, boom, it's all right. Everything's there. there. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Plus your Google Calendar is on the on the phone too, including the calendar. Yep. Everything. All I have to do is log into my Gmail account one time, one login, and everything, boom, is instantly there. Yeah. That's what I really love about you know Google Apps. So. Yeah. On that note, we will uh, see you all next Friday. Gina's Hangouts later today, right? 2.30 yeah. Pacific time, 5.30 Eastern. Yep. So don't miss that or you'll be left behind and you won't be one of the cool kids. <laughs> Joanne, you didn't talk the whole time. Just say hi. Yeah, hi. Hi. She said a few things. <laughs> she, she commented on Facebook that she loves Fridays because I she love loves Fridays. the Avo Hangout. I do. Uh, because it keeps me from actually doing work, so. Yeah, that's my downtime. Yep. Gina, Gina, when's your hangout? My hangout is at 5.30 Eastern. 2.30 Pacific. Okay. Yeah, Don't plus, miss it. There. plus, I'm a little hungover today, guys, so that's why I'm quiet. There you go. I love the honesty. <laughs> See you later. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. See y'all later. Yeah.